Dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second day of the virtual book launch of the SICOM Proceedings. We're very happy to welcome you back and also extend a warm welcome to those of you who have only just joined us today. My name is Lina Lumista. And I'm Henrik Beckwart. We are the hosts for you for the next couple of days uh, for this virtual book launch event, and we are excited to have you with us online here from Tallinn. As yesterday, we had insightful discussions on strategy and policy topics. Today, we will have two sessions dedicated to the legal articles. And tomorrow, we will have two sessions on technology. On both days, the first session begins at 1600 and the second around 17, 1500 hours at Eastern European time. Each session will last roughly one hour, followed by a 10 to 15 minute break for some leg stretching. But we also urge you to share your thoughts on Twitter using the hashtags available on our webpage, such as uh, hashtag SciCon2020 or hashtag CCDCOE. But without further ado, let's pursue our first session. And I would like to give the floor to the moderator of the first session, Dr. Guba Machak, who is a legal advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross. Guba, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lina. Thank you, Hendrik. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and uh, also for the invitation. So as you have mentioned, uh, I work for the legal division of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Now, uh, I think for our audience, it will not be much of a surprise to hear that the mandate of the International Committee of the Red Cross or the ICRC is to work for the development of this body of and so with this mandate, we also monitor the development of new technologies that could possibly be used as methods and means of warfare during armed conflicts. Now, again, for PsyCon audiences, it's uh, no surprise that the line between technological capabilities that are being developed for peacetime and those that are being developed for use in times of armed conflict is notoriously blurry. And so that's why at the ICRC, we follow the broader debates on international law and new technologies. Now, it is an honor to be here, and I view that as a part of this broader focus that at the ICRC we have. Another part uh, of doing that is working on the Cyber Law Toolkit, which is an online scenario-based resource for legal professionals on international law and cyber operations. And of course, we do that in partnership with the organizers of uh, SICON, with uh, CCDCOE. And we were lucky enough to launch uh, the toolkit last year uh, on stage at SICON. And I'm also pleased to say that several of uh, the authors of today's papers were involved in various ways with the toolkit. And so that brings me to what, of course, is the main point of today's session, which is to examine the legal challenges that are posed by new technologies. And so in the remainder of the session, we're going to hear from our distinguished speakers about topics so, of such diversity as looking at cyber retorsions all the way to autonomous weapon systems. Now, if I were to identify two broader themes in today's session, I would say that the first broad theme is to look at what are the permissible responses to hostile cyber action. And by permissible, I mean permissible under international law. And the first two papers will look at uh, retortions and at countermeasures, kind of falling under this first broad theme. Then our second theme of this panel will be to look at positive duties of states that develop new capabilities. So what are the duties that states that are in some way develop, uh, engaged in developing new capabilities, what are the duties that these states have? Now, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we turn the floor to the first of our speakers today. I'm going to do very brief introductions of our speakers only because we have very limited time. We only have 60 minutes for the entire session and our listeners and our audience can find more information about the biographies of our speakers in the book, which is already available online. So those of, uh, those of the listeners who don't yet have it, I would encourage you to download and you can find more information about all of our speakers there as well. Now, each of our speakers has agreed to speak for up to eight minutes. And this uh, brief presentation will be then followed by one question from the moderator. 
Uh, but we will be collecting questions from our audience throughout the entire session. And hopefully uh, the, these time limitations will then leave us with sufficient time at the end of the session when we will, uh, with the help of our team in Tallinn, select uh, several questions received from the audience that we will then pose to our speakers. So uh, with that brief introduction out of the way, uh, and without any further ado, I'm going to turn to the first of our speakers. And so our first speaker is Professor Jeff Kosev, who is Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity Law at the US Naval Academy. And Jeff's paper will focus on retorsion as a response to ongoing malign activities. Jeff, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll give just a, a few brief disclaimers. Uh, first, I don't have a lock in my office door, so there is a chance that my energetic six-year-old might uh, <laughs> run past here. Um, and also the more important disclaimer is that my comments today are only on my own behalf. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Naval Academy, the Department of Navy, or Department of Defense. Um, and this paper is really a continuation of the paper that I presented at SICON last year, which looked at the operational concept in the United States of Defend Forward, which is really intended to address our persistent engagement strategy of uh, addressing sub-armed conflict malign cyber actions. So I looked at the different prongs of Defend Forward, which included uh, influence operations, uh, con gathering information, positioning on adversaries' networks uh, to be able to leverage that position if uh, there are hostile acts. And what I found for the legal justification was that for most of the activities, they could be justified either as countermeasures or retortion. And there's been a lot of uh, literature about countermeasures. Uh, what I found when I was writing that paper is there was not a tremendous amount written in depth about retortion. And I tend to approach legal issues um, from the point of view of just how do you practically make things happen? Uh, how do you how do you just find the legal justification for something? And um, what I wanted to do was flip the question of is this a countermeasure and say, well, first, can we see if something's retortion? Um, because there was, there's basically a few very broad definitions of retortion, but retortion has some significant benefits. Um, so my bottom line up front for the paper is that when you're examining the legal basis for a response to subarmed conflict aggression, uh, first look at whether it should, could qualify as uh, retortion. And the shorter bottom line is uh, retortion has fewer limits if an action qualifies, if a response qualifies as retortion. And my reasoning uh, to understand, uh, for, you at first have to look at some of the limitations of countermeasures. Uh, perhaps the biggest limitation is um, they have to be in response to and uh, conducted to cease uh, the adversary's uh, violation of the target state's international legal obligations. and. The challenge here, and this has been uh, written about in great depth in a number of uh, second papers, is that uh, there's still some sub substantial debate uh, about issues such as whether sovereignty is a principle or a standalone rule, uh, what violates uh, the non-intervention principle, and uh, so, so there is some legal uncertainty. And there's also some factual uncertainty when you come down to the difficulty of attribution. So in addition to those, there are some operational constraints. Uh, as I mentioned, countermeasures only be, can only be taken to induce the state to compl comply with international legal obligations. They have duration requirements, uh, proportionality, meaning that they can only uh, be commensurate with the injury suffered, uh, the notification requirement. Uh, and as uh, was discussed in the keynote speech at last SICON, uh, there's some debate about whether collective countermeasures are permissible. I know Estonia's position is that there are, there, there is some substantial debate about that. So there's a lot, there are limitations and uncertainty um, in terms of countermeasures. Uh, so I looked at, okay, what is retortion? 
And the definition from the draft articles is unfriendly conduct, which is not inconsistent with any international obligation of the state engaging in it, even though it may be a response to an internationally wrongful act. So there's a big limitation on retortion in that it must, uh, it can't be inconsistent with uh, international legal obligations. So that is the big difference and sort of the disadvantage of using retortion. But what I want to look at is, well, there might be things that uh, could be justified uh, absent any malign actions. So if that is the case, can those qualify as retortion and therefore not face the operational limits of countermeasures? Uh, and that gives you more flexibility. Now, obviously, there are some political and pragmatic concerns. Uh, yes, while there might not be an explicit proportionality rule for retortion, um, there's, a, if it's abused, there could be some significant diplomatic, political pushback. And then also, uh, if it's a very significant, it likely would not, there, there's a good chance that it would no longer even qualify as retortion. Um, so I looked at some examples of uh, potential retortion in response to malign cyber actions. Uh, the classic example is pressure via international relations, sanctions. That's often what's given as retortion. Uh, but I wanted to look beyond that and um, see what else might be able to be done. And a lot of uh, the defend forward strategy, operational concept can qualify as retortion. Uh, so one of the components of Defend Forward is uh, warning, uh, being able to gather information. Uh, so there is some debate about at what level of accessing information on the adversary systems, at what point does that cross the boundaries of international law? Obviously, uh, the, general con the general understanding is that uh, cyber espionage is does comply with international law, although there's some pushback and also some concerns about whether if damage is caused while conducting the operations. But um, that, that's one area where it can be justifiable under international law. Um, something else uh, would be the use of honeypots and sinkholes on your own systems to be able to, uh, to attract malicious activity, to either gather information or divert it from a target. Uh, that, that there's, I, I, my, my analysis and some other analysis would be that that cited in the paper would be that that's likely not in violation of international legal obligations. So that could qualify as retortion. Uh, influencing campaigns, sending messages to cyber operators. Uh, there could, depending on what the messages say, there could possibly be some international uh, humanitarian law issues. But uh, if it's just saying, hey, we know you're there, I think that very well could qualify as uh, retortion. Positioning, that's a little closer, uh, depending on sort of what you do. If you're leveraging your position on the adversary's network, that likely could have to be justified as a countermeasure. Um, but I, I think that's a close call and it still could be uh, retortion. Uh, and then finally, slowing down the adversary, for example, if you change their passwords, um, to make operations more difficult, that starts to cross the line depending on your view of sovereignty. Uh, and that might have to be countermeasure, but you also could justify that as retortion. So I think my eight minutes is just about up. And that's basically the summary of my paper. And I look forward to discussing it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thank you for uh, sticking to the time. So let me just pose one question. I really enjoyed reading your paper in detail. And there is a point that you made also during this presentation where you said, and I think I'm quoting almost exactly, that retorsion has fewer limits than countermeasures. Now, obviously, we'll look at countermeasures in uh, the next paper. But when you talk about these limits on retorsion, I take it you mean legal limits. And that's also how you phrased it in your paper where you said that there aren't as many legal re uh, restrictions on the purpose, duration, and character of retorsions as there are on countermeasures. Now, what would you say to those who would argue that retorsions as such are not restricted at all by legal restrictions, as long as they meet, of course, the definitional requirement, which is mm -hmm. that they are not internationally unlawful? So as long as we agree on that, 
that the step to be taken, and you have listed a number of very useful examples, as long as we agree that those are not unlawful under international law, are there any other requirements that the law places on such steps? And if so, what would they be in the cyber context on your conceptualization? Well, so uh, just speaking in terms of international law, there might be some domestic law issues as well. But for international law, there's one big limit, which is that they must comply <laughs> with international law uh, and comply with international legal obligations. Um, and that's one. That that's the one big limit. It's a. It's significant. Sure. Uh, I think the limits are more not as legal as they are more pragmatic and political. Uh, the, I mean, technically, a country could exercise retortion uh, or con conduct unfriendly operations and not run into any legal problems as, uh, if they comply with international law. But um, that might raise if if a country starts for example um positioning on the networks of a country that's not done anything unfriendly or um or saying just issuing random sanctions for example that that would be something where it, it wouldn't be as much of a legal problem as it would be a uh, really political issue issue Thank you, Jeff. That's very helpful. And I would just remind our audience that you're, of course, very welcome to submit additional questions and we will have space for a Q&A at the end of the session. But now to move on, uh, we have our next speaker, and that's Dr. Przemysław Roguski, uh, who is a lecturer in law at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in Poland. And Przemek has come to us with a paper on collective countermeasures in cyberspace. So again, without further ado, Chamek, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Kubo, for the uh, introduction and uh, thank you for having me. So the topic of my slide is collective countermeasures and uh, the interest that, uh, or the reason that I have picked this topic is uh, what happened last year during SciCon. And if we could switch to the next slide, please. Uh, namely, those of you who have been here will remember that during last year's SciCon, uh, the president uh, of Estonia in her opening speech has furthered the position that not only states that are directly injured uh, would be or should be able to apply countermeasures, but also states not directly injured in order to help the injured states to deal uh, with these uh, cyber operations. Now, uh, this has uh, gathered some interest in the legal community, uh, many positive voices, and Professor Kosev has also written a paper on that. However, amongst states, uh, we have very few um, statements on this particular issue. In fact, we only have one where France, in her document on the international law applicable to, cyberspace, to operations in cyberspace, has stated that under international law, in brackets as it currently stands, uh, the countermeasures can only be taken by states or by France in its capacity as a victim. And so, in the French view, uh, collective countermeasures would not be authorized under the rules of international law as they apply today. And so, given the, those two uh, contrasting statements, the question is, well, which one is right or how do we move on, uh, forward from there? And if we could move to the next slide, please. So the question starts with, uh, you know, what is a countermeasure and when uh, can countermeasures be applied? And so maybe let's start with this basic mission. So basically, uh, we talk about uh, countermeasures when we talk about acts that would be unjustified or unlawful under international law, were it not for the fact that they are, they are taken in response to a previous violation of international law. So if state A is um, under a cyber attack that violates its rights, for instance, violates the principle of non-intervention, let's say, uh, it can take action that would uh, in itself violate the state B's rights in response, but this action is justified, or as we say, its wrongfulness is precluded by the fact that it is taken in response to this previous uh, violation of international law. Uh, and of course, certain... Um, uh, requirements have to apply like proportionality and so forth and so forth. Now the question is, can a third state see or a coalition of third states 
of allies of state A, for instance, institute countermeasures against the, the perpetrator state in order to help uh, the victim state in that. And here, herein lies the problem, because international law, as it has been developed uh, historically, is uh, in a very much bilateral relation. So the injured state, the victim state, can always respond. But the question is, can not injured state respond? And here, uh, the paper traces uh, the development of the discussion within the International Law Commission. The International Law Commission has worked on this issue for many, many years, uh, and the final report in 2000 has um, discussed, or the, the reports previous to that have discussed this issue. However, it has left the issue somewhat open. And so under the, the draft, or uh, now the articulate responsibility, other states can invoke countermeasures only if first the obligation that is breached has been owed to a group of states and it has been established for the protection of the collective interest of the group, and we call this ergo omnis partis obligations, or the obligation breached is owed to the international community as a whole, so ergo omnis obligations, and only at least under the Articles on State Responsibility, what those third states can do is only invoke their responsibility in order to ask the violating states to stop. Uh, what they cannot do is take action that would violate the rights of the, uh, of the perpetrator state, of uh, state B. Now, the question that I addressed in the paper is, well, has international law developed from 2000? And here I relied on two studies uh, done in, in 2015 and 2000, well, in, in, in the 2010s at least, uh, that argue that, in fact, international law has developed, that we have instances of state practice and opinion juris uh, that show that states apply collective countermeasures in those situations where they themselves are not victims. However, in any case, what uh, the uh, state practice shows is that uh, states apply collective countermeasures in the situations described on the slide. So when we have uh, violations of obligations that protect the collective interests uh, of a group of states or of the international community as a whole. And so in the next slide, please, we can take a look at uh, what those collective obligations are. And if you could please push the next slide on. Uh, so on, on your left, you see uh, obligations, typical obligations uh, of erga omnis character or erga omnis uh, partis character. And there you see that those obligations like prohibition of aggression, genocide, friction from slavery, racial discrimination, and so forth and so forth, uh, are indeed meant to protect the, internet, the interests of a larger group of states or of the international community as a whole. However, if we take a look at, uh, on, at the right side, at obligations that are typically violated by cyber attacks, so the rights of the victim state, like uh, the principle of non-intervention, uh, the protection from the use of force, uh, the victim state's rights to protection of its territorial sovereignty, if we indeed uh, find that sovereignty is a rule applicable to cyberspace and not only a principle, due diligence rights and so forth, you will see that most of those erga omnis obligations are not typically violated in cyber attack situations. And so the question is now, uh, will we have any typical uh, or any new obligations of erga omnis character that would apply to cyberspace. And uh, upon a review, and please next slide, upon a review of uh, what has been proposed since, uh, I have identified one principle which is not yet, but may become this collective interest uh, rule. Uh, the, this rule that is protect, protecting a corrective interest, namely the uh, rule to protect the public core of the internet. So DNS servers, uh, root servers, the, the system upon which the internet functions in itself. It has gathered support in the international community. 
uh, it has uh, gathered uh, endorsements from uh, many states in the Paris call. Uh, it is uh, included in principle two. And it has gathered support in legislation, for instance, in the U European Union uh, Cybersecurity Act. However, we are not there yet in order to find that this is indeed a solidified rule of uh, ergo omnis character that would apply and uh, the violation of which would uh, allow third states to, uh, to conduct collective countermeasures. And so in the final slide, uh, and to conclude, uh, upon a review of, uh, of the available state practice, opinio juris, uh, and the examples given, in the paper I conclude that uh, we can say first that international law has moved into the direction of allowing collective countermeasures, However, only in situations of violations of uh, ergo omnes or ergo omnes parties obligations. So we need to identify obligations that protect collective interests. Secondly, most cyber attacks right, do not violate such norms. They are in a bilateral situation where only the right of one state is violated. And therefore, in most cases, collective countermeasures would not be permitted against most cyber attacks. And of course, that is the brief conclusion of uh, a much longer paper. Thank you, Przemek. Uh, thank you very much. And also thank you for uh, sticking to the time limits. Uh, I am reliably informed from the studio that we have uh, quite a good following online, but so far no questions submitted. So I would just encourage people who are watching us uh, from the comfort of their homes, feel free to, uh, to submit questions that we will reflect on in just uh, a few minutes. In the meantime, Przemek, I have a, a one question also, and just to quickly follow up on your paper. Uh, I think you're very right to refer to the work of the International Law Commission. And I, I agree that it's a useful endeavor to look at how the general law of state responsibility has evolved after 2001, after the draft articles were completed. But there is maybe an, another uh, question, because obviously the draft articles did not uh, consider the question whether they apply in cyberspace. That was just not on uh, many people's minds in 2001. There is this foundational question whether uh, you know, the law of state responsibility applies also uh, to, to cyber operations. And many of us took that to be granted, but since your paper was finalized, uh, as uh, I know you know, there have been some voices questioning uh, whether there is this international consensus. So my question to you is, do you think we need to return a little bit, little bit back to the basics before we can address these more advanced questions of the exact contours of the law of countermeasures? What's your take on that? Mm. Well, uh, my take would be yes and no. Uh, first, uh, I, you may recall or the, the, the followers may, may know that, for instance, during the last OEWG session, uh, China in its comments on the pre-draft report indeed denied the applicability of the law of state responsibility, not only to cyberspace, but, but uh, altogether, which was kind of a shock. Uh, however, uh, as you rightly pointed out, Kubo, now most of us rely on the 2015 GGE report, on the consensus report, also shared by China at the time, uh, where states agreed that the law of state responsibility applies in cyberspace and to cyber operations. So in that sense, I would say we should not uh, go back to the roots in the sense to question whether state responsibility is applicable to conduct in cyberspace at all. What we could do and probably should do is better define the legal foundations of why we apply this particular set of rules by virtue of analogy to, uh, to conduct in cyberspace. And here I would like, to, for instance, to... to point the readers to the Czech submissions during the OEWG proceedings, uh, where the Czech representative has clearly stated upon which legal rule uh, they are relying in order to, to uh, apply um, existing rules of international law to cyberspace. Uh, namely, they referred to the ICJ Namibia decision and also to, to the Vienna Convention on um, the Law of Treaties. And so um, I think maybe we should describe better the, the legal, the applicable legal regime for transposing the rules to cyberspace, but we should not 
revisit each rule one by one. Thank you, Premek. Thank you. That's very helpful and very illuminating. And I hope we will have a chance to return to that as well during the Q&A. But for now, let's move on to the second half of today. And like I said in the beginning, we have two broader themes. So with Premek's presentation, we have finished the first theme, focusing on permissible response or on responses rather to uh, host cyber action. And now we're turning to the second broad theme of today, which examines what are the duties incumbent on states that are in various ways developing new technical and technological capabilities? And so our third speaker today is Ivana Kudlachkova. And Ivana is a research fellow at the Institute of Law and Technology at Masaryk University in Brno. So we go south from Krakow uh, and we go to the Czech Republic. And Ivana comes to us with a co-authored paper on the topic cyber weapons review in situations below the threshold of armed conflict. Ivana, over to you. So thank you very much, Kubo, for passing me the floor. And uh, first and foremost, I think I would like to say a big thank to other co-authors of uh, the paper, Colonel David Wallace from the West Point from the US and uh, Kubo and Jakub Harash also from Masaryk University. So very very big thank you to uh, to these co-authors. So in the following minutes, I would like to briefly introduce the topic of the regulation of cyber weapons under international law, more specifically the review of cyber weapons intended for the use below the threshold of armed conflict. So to do so, first I will I'm going to be introducing some definitional approaches to cyber weapons and also our working definition of cyber weapons. Then I'm going to be describing some scenarios governed by different legal regimes when a state intends to deploy a cyber weapon. So when we define a cyber weapon, there are basically two main trends. The first focuses on the intended target of the cyber weapon and on the weapon's ability to actually cause damage. The second trend simply refers to some cyber incidents without providing a the term cyber weapon. So authors very often mention Stuxnet, the DDoS uh, attacks on Estonia in 2007, or the use of malware Shemun against Saudi Aramco, but with no clear subsequent common criteria to actually establish a definition of a cyber weapon. In our working definition, we distinguish between cyber weapons and cyber systems. A weapon is one of the aspects of a cyber, uh, web, uh, of a cyber system, and the cyber weapon is used to actually cause damage or destruction to objects or injury or death to persons. So cyber systems can be used to deliver harmful software to targeted systems. And some of the harmful software might ultimately be a weapon. Therefore, we use the term software for scenarios as to capture the situation below the threshold of armed conflict. And we aim to reserve the term cyber weapon only for the context of international armed conflict. The term weapon carries normative meaning, pointing us directly to the Article 36 of the Additional Protocol 1. Automatically, it triggers the requirement to conduct a formalized weapon review to determine whether employment of a weapon would, in some or all circumstances, uh, be prohibited by Additional Protocol 1 or by any other rule of international law. We therefore believe that software review in broader terms reflects the ratio of the already existing legal framework. In our paper, we present a scenario-based analysis involved uh, the hypothetical escalation of conflict between two fictional states, Berylia and Crimsonia. We follow the two tracks in our analysis. First, we deal with relationship between state and its citizens and then between two states engaged in uh, hypothetical escalation. So regarding the state versus citizen track, any state must be aware of its human rights obligation stemming from international treaties. If there is an exceptional situation of crisis or emergency, there is actually an option allowing derogation from such obligations. Therefore, prior to the deployment of software, a state should ensure that its actual deployment will not violate the human rights of its citizens. So this could be done by conducting a legal review of software against relevant legal obligations and possible derogations in a state of emergency. 
In case of state versus state interactions, we lay down several scenarios. The first one is why. Uh, so this is one of the many unsettled issues. Is software actually capable of causing physical damage or loss of functionality or infringement on, uh, upon territorial integrity? In our paper, we bypass this issue by suggesting a software review that focuses on the question of whether the targeted state will perceive the cyber operation as a violation of sovereignty rather than settling the issue for good. Um, a situation might be further escalated to a point when an issue of non-intervention comes into forefront. So non-intervention basically means or deals with uh, the decision-making capacity of a state to formulate policies in relation to its internal and external affairs. But it's important to keep in mind that only coercive acts reaching a sufficient level of magnitude and intending a targeted state to change its policy are legally relevant. However, this threshold is always fluid and context dependent. We might also imagine that a situation is further escalated by remote destruction of data. Taking into consideration the context and some situations, states' reactions might push the whole uh, conflict over the threshold of the well, before using software that might lead to a violation of, uh, you know, of the prohibition of the use of force, states should actually conduct a legal review to assess the possible consequences to determine whether a particular cyber operation may lead to violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United, of the United Nations Charter. And furthermore, Article 51 of the UN Charter, which grants a victim state the option to respond with force, uh, comes into play. So last but not least, when a situation leads into a state of armed conflict, the norms of IHL, of international humanitarian law, are also triggered. So then all states, whether they have ratified additional protocol one or not, are required to ensure that the means of warfare they acquire or use comply with of international humanitarian law. So um, to briefly sum it up, the term weapon is used in different contexts and often without the normative meaning given to it by international law. The term weapons review immediately brings, us, brings out requirements according to the Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1. But it's undeniable that the use of software for security purposes has consequences in terms of international law, both in state-to-state -state or state-to-citizens relationships. So broader understanding of software review concerning international obligation is, or we believe is, a viable policy option. We argue that a system of a broader software review would bring first more understanding of legal consequences in general, and second, better framing of policy responses in terms of escalation or de-escalation of potential conflicts. So there are plenty of legal requirements to be considered when deploying cyber means. These range from human rights obligation and their possible derogation in case of emergency, all the way to applicability of international humanitarian law in armed conflict. Rather unsurprisingly, we conclude that there is no obligation to conduct a review outside Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1. However, in terms of practical necessity, it's worth considering a broader software review to better understand the nuances of deployment you know, of, cyber, of cyber weapon and software in the conflict. So additionally, this would allow more respect to international obligations. So there is no obligation to conduct review outside Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1. However, there are plenty of policy benefits in conducting broader software assessment with regard to uh, legal obligations. So that was basically the short uh, summary of the paper and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Ivana, and uh, thank you for your paper as well. Uh, congratulations to you and your co-authors. I, I really enjoyed reading the paper in its entirety. I recommend it to everybody, especially for this scenario approach, which I found very helpful in dating the issues. And I also found uh, your definition of cyber weapons very uh, helpful. Let me uh, 
take you up on on the on, on something on the point that you made just at the end of your presentation and on the word should as you have been using it throughout the presentation so several times that states should engage in this uh, legal review also outside of the context of an update or outside of the context of cyber capabilities are being developed for the use in armed conflict. Now, at the end of invitation, you made it clear that one is a legal obligation. Article 36 reflects a binding legal obligation for states, whereas the other, we could say, a policy preference, so sure that states in the peacetime context don't violate other applicable rules uh, of international law. So I hope I, I understood that correctly. And if so, my question to you would be, do you believe that it's uh, useful or desirable for states to translate or convert this policy preference, so something that they should do as a matter of good policy, should they convert it into a legal obligation akin to Article 36, but for peacetime context? And if this would be meaningful, desirable, then what would be the, the trajectory, how they should do that review? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so in general, the answer could be quite straightforward and it would be yes, but I think it's necessary to take into consideration uh, several remarks. So nowadays some states have already published their statements concerning applicability of international law in cyberspace. But when we carefully look at these statements, they are focused on very general legal issues, for instance, such as violation of sovereignty through cyber means. And none of these statements deals with some specific issues, such as software review or even weapons review in cyber context. So, but no. when we realize these are sovereign entities in um, in charge of international lawmaking, there could actually be a state or a group of states which could endeavor to initiate discussion concerning software review among states. I believe that especially states, which already published some statements concerning applicability of international law in cyberspace. So I would be really aware to say how the states should do it, because I believe that States are still sovereign entities in charge of making international law. Uh, certainly, the discussion could be initiated, for instance, by ICRC or some other organizations, but I think that international community has to be ready to make such a decision to accept a requirement of, of software review. And moreover, I'm not pretty sure that states are ready to maybe at least initiate a discussion right now. But on, I, I believe that this process and maybe the unwillingness of states these days or these years uh, could be or will be accelerated if states witness a serious cyber incident which reveals the practical necessity to conduct software review. And maybe states will resort to, let's say, reactive lawmaking approach in response uh, to, to a cyber incident. So. I'm, I'm really aware to say what states should do because states are in charge of lawmaking activities. But I think it would be great to at least initiate the discussion about uh, cyber weapons review or broader software review. But um, I'm, I believe that a lawyer is not uh, the person who should actually say what states should do. So I would just recommend to at least open the discussion and initiate a discussion. That's it. Thank you, Ivana. And I, and I agree with you that a lot of the development of the law has been very reactive in its nature. And yeah. thank you also for the suggestion that uh, the ICRC should take this up, certainly discuss it with my colleagues after the session. <laughs> but we are for time. Thank you for your answer. And let's move on to our fourth speaker. Uh, and so that's continuing on the same second theme of this uh, session. Uh, we will have Alexi Kayander as our fourth speaker today. Alexi, I understand, is speaking actually from Tallinn. Alexi is an MA candidate in uh, at the Tallinn University of Technology. And he comes to us also with a co-authored paper. And Alexis' topic today is positive obligations under Common Article 1 to the Geneva Conventions and autonomous weapons systems. So over to you, Alexis. 
Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. I'm very glad for this opportunity to present our paper, The Making the Cyber Mercenary Autonomous Weapon Systems and Common Article 1. So without further ado, let's look at the first part of that equation, which is Common Article 1 of the Geneva Conventions, which contains an obligation to respect uh, and to ensure respect uh, for the conventions by the high contracting parties. And in 2016, the ICRC released a new commentary which confirmed the existence of a positive external obligation, meaning that the high contracting parties have to take proactive steps uh, in preventing ongoing and future violations, as well as bringing an erring uh, party to a conflict to an attitude of respect for the conventions. And uh, in this regard, the parties must uh, use their influence and uh, do everything in their power to prevent those future and ongoing violations. And in our paper, we examined uh, how will this obligation affect uh, states that are supplying autonomous weapon systems. But before we get to that, we should have a look at the um, other side of that equation, which is the autonomous weapon systems themselves. So an autonomous weapon system uh, can be defined as a system that can independently identify and make the decision to engage targets. But it should be noted that not all autonomous weapon systems are created equally, in the sense that their physical manifestations can vary quite significantly, from, for example, a missile defense system to a dreaded killer drone. And because of that, their risk profiles for foreseeable violations of IHL also vary quite significantly. And therefore, uh, it is important to emphasize that uh, autonomous weapon systems cannot be generalized merely by the fact that they're autonomous, but you actually do have to look at the risk prof uh, profile associated with that particular physical manifestation of an autonomous weapon system. Now, the decision making of these systems will be most likely a combination of pre-programmed instructions as well as learned behavior. And now when we bring back that obligation to ensure respect for the conventions, an obvious solution for a supplying state might be that they would pre-program their supplied systems to such a degree that they can't possibly ever be used in violation of the relevant rules uh, of war. However, uh, not merely from a technological point of view, but also from a point of view of the complexity of the scenarios that some of these systems may find themselves in, that is most likely not a uh, feasible option, at least for the near future for these sort of very rigid, uh, well-defined laws that you might find in, for example, Asimov's three laws. So the first one being that a robot cannot cause a human to come to harm through its action or inaction, nor can it harm it directly, which obviously for an autonomous weapon system context would have to be slightly different, but it could be, for example, that the system could never destroy civilian infrastructure, which uh, would cause problems the moment that system would come into contact with, for example, an object of dual purpose, say a civilian bridge that was built by civilians, uh, which could be a legitimate uh, military target depending on the circumstances. So in that sense, this uh, possibility pre program would most likely not definitively eliminate the possibility of autonomous weapon systems cause, supplied autonomous weapon systems causing violations. Which leads us to the next possibility, which is tethering, uh, which is defined in the context of this paper as the capacity to remotely disable, monitor, or take control of uh, supplied autonomous weapon systems. And now the question is, is this something that would be required by Common Article 1 or could be justified by reference to Common Article 1? Now, arguably, there is a compelling legal argument that could be made for this in the sense that it would be very effective at preventing ongoing uh, violations as well as future violations, not merely by those autonomous weapon systems themselves, but the uh, whole military of the state that is using them because the possibility of disabling possibly a substantial number of autonomous weapon systems used by that state would create leverage and a a deterrent for that state to start committing violations in the first place because doing that would have significant negative uh, effects on them. However, there is a second part to this, which is uh, what I refer to as the Swiss mercenary of old slash cyber mercenary analogy. The first part refers to the Swiss mercenaries of the 1500s, whose use would come with certain conditions, such as if the Swiss Confederacy was under attack, then those mercenaries could be recalled to defend their homeland. So a prudent user of those mercenaries would understand that they cannot rely on these troops in all circumstances, that they will always have this link to their homeland, meaning that uh, in the modern context, these autonomous weapon systems that are tethered would similarly have a 
connection, in this case the tether, back to their state of origin, which would mean that they can't be relied on in all circumstances in a similar fashion. Obviously, those circumstances could vary from when that state that is using those systems is uh, committing violations of IHL, or it could be a conflict with the state that originally supplied those systems. But this terminology used in the analogy, especially the term mercenary, is quite problematic because in its uh, legal definition presently, uh, a mercenary does not have a link to uh, his or her state of origin, which is the central aspect of the cyber mercenary analogy in this case, which is why I took the bold step of uh, suggesting a new term uh, specific for tethered autonomous weapon systems, which would be a portmanteau between autonomous and mercenary, autocenary or autocenaries, which would be defined as a tethered autonomous weapon system that can remotely be disabled, monitored, or taken control of uh, by the supplier or state of origin. This would come with significant political and military effects, military effects not just by the possibility of being able to disable those systems, but also on a larger scale, uh, states that are able to produce their own systems uh, that would be untethered and therefore quote unquote more reliable would have an advantage over those states whose ranks would be filled with these autocenaries and in that sense would have a quote unquote less reliable military. And on the political side of that, you would have that those states that are using these autocenaries would be, have a significant incentive to maintain favorable relations with the state that is supplying with, uh, them with those systems. And on the flip side of that, the supplying state could use that political leverage given by that tether to uh, exploit for their own political gains. Which leads us to the conclusions, if the uh, slide will change. Uh, in any case, arguably there are compelling legal arguments for tethering to be required by Common Article 1 because it would be very effective at preventing ongoing and future violations. However, it would come at the at a cost, which in this case basically sets added compliance against filling the ranks of possibly many militaries with these cyber mercenaries or autocenaries. Now, this would obviously have those significant political and military ramifications I just spoke about, but perhaps to mitigate this to a certain degree, Tethering could be limited to only high-risk systems uh, rather than low-risk systems, which uh, reduce the amount of tethering. Uh, as I mentioned, not all autonomous weapon systems are created equal. And uh, in that case, you would still be left with the lingering question that if a state is supplying both tethered and untethered systems, are those untethered systems really actually untethered or are they just hidden? Uh, that is probably a question that would linger. But in any case, Common Article 1 should not be ignored uh, when considering the use and development of autonomous weapons systems. Uh, and that is the conclusion, really, that can be drawn at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexei. And I agree with you 100%. Common One and nor any other provision of the Geneva Conventions should be ignored. Uh, and I'm really glad to hear also and to see in your paper the very close reliance on the ICRC commentary on the Geneva Conventions. Now, my question relates to, to the relationship between technical feasibility and reasonableness. And so, as you will know, in the interpretation of the ICRC commentary, the positive obligation under Common Article 1 is limited by saying that states are only required to do what is reasonably in their power. Now, in your paper, you seem to suggest that in the context of the autonomous systems, those measures are technically feasible, are also within the reasonable power of the supplying state. But I would put it to the difference between things that are quite easily technically implementable, like pre-programming, and then the extreme versions of tethering on the other side that you, that you speak of, such as you know, constant monitoring and constant vigilance. So how do you see this relationship? How can we establish what can be reasonably expected of states when it comes to these capabilities? Thank you, that's an excellent question and I'm very glad you asked it because uh, I actually dedicated a whole chapter to this very question in my thesis uh, and I will try to very 
briefly summarize that. Uh, in my presentation, when I mentioned tethering, I did uh, mention that uh, remote control, monitoring, and disabling, uh, as if they were all measures of equal reasonableness, whereas in reality, they're not. They have to be examined uh, each individually. Uh, in this context, if we look at, we start off with monitoring. Uh, monitoring by itself couldn't really prevent ongoing violations. It would be highly invasive, uh, as it would give the possibility to uh, conduct espionage. And in that sense, it would also be very onerous, as you mentioned, that there would be significant uh, resources and manpower that would have to be devoted to maintaining that vigilance. And in that sense, it doesn't seem like a very reasonable option uh, for a tether, uh, considering that it wouldn't actually be very effective at doing what it is supposed to be doing, i.e. preventing ongoing and future violations of IHL which leads us neatly to the uh, remote controlling. And in regards to remote controlling, there would have to be some degree of monitoring associated, for it would make no sense to remote control a system that you cannot understand what it is doing or cannot see what it is doing. So in that sense, it would be also invasive uh, and onerous, possibly even more onerous than monitoring, as you would also have to dedicate resources to the remote controlling aspect, which may require manpower and additional technology. However, of course, it would be effective at preventing those ongoing and future violations, as you could uh, change the actions of that autonomous weapon system. However, I would say that the possibility for remote control would bring with it some quite uncomfortable questions regarding who was actually responsible for some actions that that system may have done. And in that sense, I wouldn't suggest that this is necessarily a reasonable option either, which leaves us with the possibility of disabling and that a tether could only disable the system, which would be the least invasive, as it wouldn't, by definition, need a monitoring aspect. Uh, it wouldn't require the same sort of manpower and resource dedication, as that uh, tether would only be used when the circumstances are such that its use would be warranted. Uh, and in that sense, it would uh, seem to be the most reasonable option, as it would very clearly be able to prevent ongoing and future violations for that system would not be able to function. And in that regard, its uh, main shortcoming would be that, as it does not involve monitoring, the information regarding those violations uh, that would warrant the use of the tether in the first place would have to be collected from other, other sources. However, arguably, that is something that can be mitigated through other means. And therefore, to answer your question, uh, the reasonableness has to be looked at individually. And arguably, purely disabling would be the most uh, reasonable option. Thank you, Alexi. And thank you for noting that these things exist on the spectrum. I think that's very helpful. And personally, I look forward to reading the chapter of your thesis in, in detail. Now, uh, we have two minutes left in the session, and now there are some questions trickling in. So let's do at least one of them, the very first one that I got from the team in Tallinn, and it's directed at Ivana, at uh, our third speaker. So uh, Ivana, if, uh, let me just read the question that we have received from our audience. It goes as follows. Uh, the transition from developing to deploying a cyber weapon or a cyber capability is not a linear one and often the target is accessed in a disruptive manner during peacetime. So to what extent should weapons reviews reflect peacetime law? Does an IHL-centric review procedure suffice? So it's a question about the relationship between peacetime law and an IHL-centric review. Uh, would you like to elaborate on this briefly, and then we will wrap up the session. So thank you very much for this question. And honestly, I would really need more time to think about it in a more complex way. But uh, just to briefly answer, I think that um, if you focus on peacetime, um, I think that there is not that much space for state to state relationship in peacetime. So if there is a disruptive activity during peacetime is probably more an issue for for national law, international law, except with, uh, with the exception of human rights law. So if you focus on the state to state level, I think there is not that much of international law, but during peacetime we should really focus on human rights obligations. So 
to, to think and to realize if by, uh, by a disruptive cyber activity, there is a possibility to violate human rights obligation or not. Because I believe that if, if during, or if among states, it, it, let's say, violates the peacetime or it violates the sovereignty of another state, then we are not talking about peacetime anymore. I mean, it's the violation of sovereignty, whether, or whether a rule of a principle doesn't matter right now, but if by a cyber activity you violate sovereignty of another state, it's not peacetime anymore. It does not mean that it's an international armed conflict, but between peacetime and international armed conflict, we have various layers to be, uh, to be taken into consideration. So on the level of state-to-state -state interactions, I believe that we have, let's say, either peacetime, but there is not that much to talk about um, using uh, using norms of international law. When we talk about peacetime, I think that what we should really take into consideration is uh, is the wide range of human rights obligations and the state to citizen uh, approach. And if uh, the IHL centric review procedure suffices. Uh, honestly, I'm not pretty sure if the IHL centric review is, uh, is, um, is enough or not, or if, if, if it suffices or not, because the IHL centric review was, uh, was proposed for a different situation. So I'm not pretty sure that we can really draw let's say, draw inspiration from, uh, from the IHL-centric uh, review. Uh, that's it. Thank you for the question very much. And I, I, I will think about it in a, in a greater detail. Thank you, Ivana. And uh, thank you for this answer. I agree with you 100%. A lot of these things need further reflection. And in any event, the whole hour was not meant as an examination in detail of the purpose. I hold them to everybody who's listening to us. And I got them telling that uh, we have to wrap up, you know, congratulations once again. If this uh, session was truly happening in Tallinn as, as they usually are uh, in SciCon, I would now be saying, and let's see you all during the coffee break, a nice uh, cake and a cup of continue chatting. Now, today that won't be possible, but uh, in any event, I really enjoyed this session, and I'm going to pass the word back to Tallinn, and I look forward to the next law panel, which will start in about 15 minutes from now. Thank you all. Thank you, Kubo, for moderating the session, and of course, thanks to our speakers, distinguished speakers, for this very exciting presentations and discussion. Yeah, and as uh, Kubo mentioned, it is now time for a coffee break where you may stretch your legs and we can reset the stage. Uh, we will be back again at 17, 1500 hours Eastern European time, uh, ready for the second and final session of the Legal Day. Thank you.